Hello, everybody. <laughs> So I just laughed at the wonderful because Kubernetes can be, it can be great, but it can be also be a pain in the ass. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, you know, as we all like, if you play with it, it it's very useful. And uh, I uh, have been playing with it for the past five years, uh, actually. Um, so yeah, we'll start off. Uh, to break the ice, uh, I want to introduce myself as I'm, this is actually pretty much my first time doing a talk at a conference. So I figured I'll introduce myself, <laughs> thank you. So actually, I'm a local. I grew up in Santa Ana, California, which is about an hour away if you go a little bit down south. It's in Orange County. Um, I'm actually Hispanic. My uh, second generation parents are from El Salvador. And uh, yeah, right now, currently, a uh, family of four, a wife and two kids, one in one year old and four years old. And I graduated from CSUN, so I stayed in California pretty much my whole life. And uh, CSUN, not familiar with the area, it's right here uh, up in North LA and uh, graduated in 2016. And now, uh, s since I graduated, I went to work at Blizzard. Uh, I actually did an internship when I was in CSUN and then uh, got hired full time from there. So I started off as a junior associate, uh, junior SRE, and then I went to mid and then uh, to senior. Uh, I worked in the Battle.net team. Uh, I was there for about three years, yeah, three years. And uh, it was mainly dealing with the public like facing APIs and websites, so like, you know, play Overwatch, World of Warcraft.com, and stuff like that. Currently, I switched over to Team 3, which is the Diablo team, which is the Diablo franchise. Uh, so if there's like Diablo issues, either one of my coworkers is being called up if there's some reliability issues. And just hobbies of mine, uh, I enjoy playing poker, fantasy football, watching uh, anime, reading manga, uh, One Piece, if anyone's familiar with it, my, by far my favorite. Uh, I enjoy snowboarding and of course video games. And in case you want to get my social media, I'm somewhat active, I don't use it as much as I should, but uh, you can follow me, uh, it's Jinx. It's funny because this account, I got it in 20, 2009 I think, and I don't know why I added a three on there. Uh, now I can't get it, someone took my account, so I can't even put Jinx on there. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> so. What are controllers? Um, so controllers, they are a, they work as a control loop. They pretty much keep, they try to keep a desired state on your system. So they, you have a current state, you have a desired state. So it, it, the Kubernetes documentation is a very, a very, very good example of a thermostat. A thermostat, you set it to, let's say, 70 degrees. Um, it will try to keep that desired state over time, so the, if the temperature increases, it's going to go back and try to decrease it. So that's how a kind of control controller works in your system. And so what it does, it watches the state of your cluster, so it looks at uh, the Kubernetes resources and it will create them. So let's say a, a good example would be the, like a pod, like pods. If your pod goes down, it goes to a state, it goes to a state of zero, but your desired state might be one or two. So the controller what will do, it will spin up another pod, and that's how pretty much it operates. Um, there's also a term called operators, which are domain-specific controllers, and these can be very specific to an application. An example would be, uh, you're familiar with the Prometheus operator, and uh, it will look at uh, Prometheus custom resources that, uh, that you've created or spun up, and it will, pretty much, let's say a Prometheus rule that you create, if you create a new resource, it, the controller's gonna look at it and create it for you. Uh, I'll go to more details uh, as I go on. Um, but just wanna give a heads up that I kind of blur the lines between a controller and operator, uh, because they are different, but I just like using the, the term controller. So in case I do a specified application that uh, it's actually an operator, I might have said controller, just a heads up, but I'm gonna do that. Um, so let's see. Okay, so we'll start off with the first one, the ingress controller. Um, I kind of caught it end of the last conversation, the last presentation was talking about Nginx controller. Um, so I'll go over three, uh, just because these are supported by the Kubernetes project. Um, but there's a lot, a lot of controllers. Uh, some of you might be familiar with Kong. Uh, there's uh, Traffic, or Traffic, I'm not sure how to pronounce that one, but 
Uh, those would be one of the more popular ones as well. Uh, so the the ears controller, what it does, it um, it it looks at, so it depends on which controller you're using. So like the Nginx controller, um, it will look for, it looks at the, the controller looks at, it talks to the control plane, the API, and if there's like a ingress or service that gets created, um, it will look at that and if it matches certain requirements, it will spin up a uh, an ingress for it. So Nginx uses annotations. Uh, you use annotations so that I have let's say host name, and then you have the address on there that you want. The controller will look at it and spin up uh, an ingress with that uh, host name that you have in the annotation. Uh, the, the reason I have the Nginx controller as well is because it's, it's pretty much, you don't need a cloud provider. You can have your own, so you spin up like you have your own uh, cluster and it's in a different cloud or private cloud, OpenStack or whatever it is. Um, you don't have to rely on a provider. So the, a, the AWS Load Balancer controller uh, works in a similar way as the Nginx controller, um, but it actually creates load balancers on uh, AWS. So it could create ALBs or network load balancers. And it works in a very similar way where it's annotations that get added. Um, and then the Ingress GC is just the, the uh, Google Cloud version of it. Um, so these would be three in case you wanted to allow uh, external access to one of your services. Um, and those will be the Ingress controller. And then I think I'll show this slide I think after or the skill. So in case you want like the links, I put them on there just in case you want to go to the GitHub repo. Uh, a lot of these, are, all these are open source and they also have, uh, my pre preference is home charts. In case you do want to install them, uh, there's home chart as well. Uh, but these are just applications themselves. And then, as I mentioned, there's a lot of English controllers, and if you click this link, it's the Kubernetes documentation. They have, uh, last time I saw it, there was like 15 plus controllers on there. Uh, so in case you wanted to look through and see if none of these fit your use case, you can go on this site and you know go through and see if there's anything that you might be able to pick out. Um, then for monitoring, uh, one of the controllers that uh, I prefer or that I like, it's I mentioned the Prometheus operator. Uh, the Prometheus operator, it it creates custom resources onto, onto your, your cluster. Um, so you have, for example, uh, if you're familiar with the Prometheus operator, um, they have, they create a custom resource definition that is called, uh, just like Prometheus rules. Uh, there is service monitors, pod monitors, and these are pretty much resources that the operator is gonna look at. So in case you do create a resource with that kind, it will spin it up for you. So if you create a Prometheus rule, um, you can create it, takes a, depending on the time that, you, that it scrapes, um, it, it will spin up a, either alert, an alert manager, or whatever, however you set it up. Uh, it has service monitors, which is like an abstraction layer. In case you want to monitor a service, you, it looks at labels, and uh, it makes it very dynamic. Instead of having to manually create or uh, make changes or maybe even like an app deploy to add stuff, so it makes it very dynamic. Um, it's also, of course, this one is an operator and it looks at the API uh, for any of these CRDs. Um, and then the Kubernetes stack, this one is actually, it's not a controller, it's more of a Helm chart. And uh, the reason I put it on here is because it's super useful because it, it installs the the operator it installs Grafana for you, it installs Alert Manager, and um, pretty much end-to-end -end stack of uh, Prometheus. So once you install this, the I will give a warning that the values file in Helm is very large and it's massive. Uh, so if you go through it, it can, can be kind of painful, but you get you get kind of adjusted to it and you can kind of see what you can do with it. Uh, but a uh, better minimum, you can enable everything and you would get uh, even the metric server to scrape metrics by default. You get default Prometheus rules that are uh, super useful. Um, yeah, so then secrets. Uh, secrets, uh, if you play with Kubernetes, like they say secrets, but it's actually just a base four encoded string. Like you can cat it, or you can view the resource and you could decode and get the string. Uh, so that's not so secure, but how do you put this in, you know, GitOps is very popular, how do you put this in source control? And 
it's not good to put passwords in source control just because, I mean, obvious reasons. Um, but uh, my favorite is external secrets just because it's very agnostic and it, uh, it, what it does, it, it allows you to create secrets without having to uh, like hard code them. It looks at a provider, it pulls them and injects them onto your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so same thing as an operator and the external secret management systems which can be like AWS Secrets Manager, uh, it could be uh, the Google one, uh, yeah, Google Secrets Manager, and then uh, of course the agnostic one would be Vault. It's not uh, specific to a cloud. You can spin up your own version of, of, of Vault or spin up your own Vault instance and um, manage your secrets there. So the external secrets makes it very easy to you know, play with these different providers and you can you know, go for that cloud agnostic way or you know, wanna go cloud specific, you can. Or if you wanna, you have you know, multi-architecture uh, infrastructure, you can have one external secrets that you know, can talk to different providers, which is super neat. And it, it's also neat because it's, it's very dynamic. So as the operator, it, it, complete, it, it always watches. So there's a change on the, on the secret, uh, let's say a secrets manager, you update the secret, and depending on how your app's configured, if you update the secret, it very quickly, it, the controller updates the secret on Kubernetes resource. So you don't have to actually like go and apply a change onto the Kubernetes cluster because you just update on Secrets Manager and it updates, updates, it, updates it on the secret on the cluster. And um, if your app can you know, make changes in runtime, you don't have to do any restarts, you can do live changes and let's say a password gets uh, you know, exposed or you know, something happens, you can just go on Secrets Manager and update that secret. And you also have, uh, depending on your Secrets Manager setup, you can have, um, versions, so in case someone deletes a secret or you need to get the old one for some odd reason, <laughs> you can just look at the, at the versions and pull it up. Um, and yeah, it interface, with, so this one's kind of different because it actually is it's not talking to the API for those changes, it's actually talking to the provider uh, for the controller to keep that state. And then uh, DNS, our favorite. Uh, external DNS would be my go-to, uh, just because it's also um, kind of similar to external uh, secrets, where it could be uh, cloud agnostic or different providers, and uh, it works in a similar way as the Nginx controller, where it looks at annotations. So you have an ingress and you add an annotation um, for external DNS, it, it will create that record. And uh, yeah, so pretty much it it's just annotation based. You add a annotation to your ingress and uh, you'll get DNS. And then auto scaling. Uh, for this one, I put um, vertical pod auto scaler. Um, what it is, it, um, it dynamically sets resource and limits on your, on your pod based on um, your usage. So in case like sometimes you know you spin up a, a application or service and you're not sure like, you know, what do I set for my resource consumption, right? Like, you can put limits, but you truly don't know unless you, you know, you're kind of just guesstimating. Uh, the VPA, what it does, it kind of does that work for you. It looks at trends, um, and it will scale your, 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 uh, your deployment or pod with those resources and limits based on usage. Um, one thing, though, uh, the VPA can be uh, pretty dangerous, in my opinion. Uh, it uses admission controllers, and uh, admission controllers are a different type of, uh, it's a controller, and what it does, it intercepts Kubernetes API request before like modifying an object. So a VPA, if uh, you create a pod, and uh, what it does, uh, admission controllers have uh, one thing called uh, mutating webhooks and validating webhooks. So depending on the application, it can use either one or both. And um, so if you create a pod and it, it would intercept it if it's a mutating webhook. It would modify that request and then apply it to the to Kubernetes uh, API. Uh, one of the reasons why I say it's dangerous is because it's intercepting request. Uh, I've had issues where uh, the VPA had issues and the cluster couldn't scale any pods because every request for the pod creation was getting stopped by the by the controller or by the uh, mutating webhook and the validating one, and 
Uh, so we were like, there was enough resources, the, the nodes were there, uh, but for some reason, we would scale, let's say, pot to like 50, and um, it just, nothing would happen. It would just be context deadline. I'm not sure if anyone's seen that before with the play with Kubernetes. And it's super vague because it, it's, it could be anything. It could be timeouts, it could be config errors. Uh, so we just get con constant contact deadline errors. And, and then it was the VPA and the mutating webhook that was stopping the create uh, action on the API. Uh, so this one, you have to be careful as well because also the trends, uh, if your traffic is very spiky, like it's very dynamic, um, there might not be a pattern and it might not give you the best recommendation based on the behavior. Um, and it does come with three components. So the re-recommender, the updater, and admission plugin. Uh, the one I recommend is the recommender. And this one, it, it runs on your cluster, but it doesn't apply the changes. So what it does, it, it tracks your trends, it sees, use, it sees your usage, but it doesn't apply them. So this is the more safer route because you see what's actually uh, recommending, but it's not gonna change your resources. Uh, so, so you can see from there that you can, you know, update your deployment with those resource limits that, that you want, rather than having the VP dynamic skills for you, which can be pretty risky, especially in production. Um, the other one would be certificates. Uh, this one, if you have a either like an internal, uh, you, you do self-signing certs, or uh, you don't want to pay for certs because there's Let's Encrypt, you're unfamiliar with it, you can pretty much get free certificates. Um, there is some throttling and so you have to be kind of careful with uh, using it sometimes, but um, you can get certs for free um, rather than you know paying a, a provider for them uh, when it's all totally free. Uh, it also makes it easy to renew certs so you don't have to constantly, you know, I'm pretty sure everyone or people that are working in production have had a cert expire. Um, and you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, you kind of shake your head and you're like, crap, like <laughs> not another one. You try to monitor one, there's always one that's missed. Uh, cert manager, what it does, it, it, when it's getting close to the expiration time, it will renew it for you. Um, and hopefully if you know, have a learning, you can kind of get a heads up even before that because even, you know, if you have to watch cert manager, make sure it's not down or, having issues because that's another point of failure. Uh, it uses Vault, uh, Benefi, uh, if you have your own private PKI, and uh, of course, Let's Encrypt. So all this is great, and um, you know, it's so many applications, but how do you install it? Uh, I'll, I'll put this more like high level, uh, just because I don't think it's part of the, you know, you want to learn about controllers, not deployment tools. Uh, but there's many methods in case you do want to install it. Um, you can use uh, two popular ones for packaging your applications is either Helm or Customize. Um, personally, I like Helm myself. Uh, Customize, has, at least for me, has been difficult to read, uh, but I see some people do some awesome things with it. Um, and then you have automation tools. Uh, you have Argo CD, uh, I'm not sure you're familiar with it. It uh, uses, uh, which is tricky, it uses Helm templates, not Helm itself. Um, so it actually, renders your templates and applies them. Uh, but you can't do like a Helm LS and see your application or do like a Helm diff and use Helm like functions to uh, interact with the Helm deployment because it's not an actual Helm deployment. Um, but Argo CD is awesome because it, um, at least from my experience has been, the maintenance has been, you know, almost non-existent. It, it practically just been running. And um, it gives you a kind of a visual of your applications. So you can see all the resources. So you see, you can see the controller. You can see the pods, the the, the uh, stateful sets, services, um, and then we have Spinnaker, which is a, another deployment tool. Uh, this one was built by Netflix. Um, it it's a, pretty much a, it's built a bunch of microservices, and uh, there's use cases for it, and it can make a Helm chart for you. Um, Depending on your use case, uh, I found it too cumbersome to install and to maintain just because of different microservices. And then Jenkins, which either you could do a simple Jenkins job and deploy an application, or even JenkinX. Um, personally, I don't have experience with that one, but 
uh, it is an option. And then Terraform, Terraform, you can use a Helm provider in case you do want to stick with Helm. Uh, Terraform and Ansible is kind of like a, you're kind of crossing a, a thin line because in my opinion, Terraform should be infrastructure. It shouldn't be managing your applications, but uh, there are use cases for it in case you want to spin up a, yeah, let's say you have a Terraform module or cluster and um, you, you want to bootstrap a cluster and you want to like auto install something right when you create a cluster. Like let's say, let's say you want to install uh, external DNS and external secrets automatically. You can use Terraform and the Terraform provider. So when you spin up a cluster via Terraform, it already has the components there for you. So there, there's use cases, but uh, I, I would say it's a, uh, it's a thin line that I uh, kind of be, be careful that you're not managing all your applications with Terraform. And then of course, with great power comes great tech depth. Uh, all this is neat and it's nice, but it's a lot of applications, right? You're running this in production and it's open source. So there's different you know, release cycles, there's vulnerabilities, there's all, all different kind of things that uh, you kind of have to stay on top of because you can get very behind. Uh, I'm pretty sure like in the past month, like just applications had like either five chart releases and, um, and yeah, so you have to be conscious of all the different apps that you're installing. And also, you know, uh, always, uh, it's difficult to kind of keep track of them, but I would say, say set it like a cadence. Uh, my preference is, you know, every either, every quarter, or, or, like you can even follow the community's release cycle and um, follow, uh, like don't leave it behind because you, you'll get very behind and then what would happen, in my experience, also, what has also happened is that, uh, you know, communities have been deprecating and removing APIs. So if you have an old version of an application, it might have an old uh, API that it's using. So then you kind of have to update because you have to, you have to upgrade your cluster, but then you get in this line where now you're like, oh crap, I'm like 10 versions behind and now it's like a, there's a bunch of breaking changes that happen in between those, and now you're either dealing with fires or uh, you're not spending more time than if you were just to gradually, you know, update every quarter and update your your charts every quarter. Um, that would be my recommendation, but it's very difficult to get, to keep track of everything. Uh, right now, I think I just mentioned ten applications that would be running, and then all those have different cycles. Um, and uh, yeah, so actually that went faster <laughs> than I thought. Um, but I'll leave it open for questions. And also wanna put some closing words, and this is completely unrelated to <laughs> everything in this presentation, but I just want to kind of say, you know, don't forget the golden rule, treat others how you wanna be treated. And uh, you know, in the current environment, just be nice to each other, be respectful, and you know, help each other. This is the open source community, and we're here to learn from each other, help. And this is how I started myself. Like I came to conferences, open source conferences, and even mentors that helped me out and you know, asking questions, failing fast, and you know, just help each other. And you know, as you start off this, you know, go on in this conference, you know, talk to each other, network, and just help each other. And that's it. So with that, do we have some questions? Don't give me a hard one. <laughs> you have any experience working with Helm file, and um, can you say anything about that? Which one? Helm file. No. What is it? I'm curious. It's a Helm wrapper. No, I haven't had the pleasure, but um, I'll, I'll look into it. Do you, I mean, we have plenty of time, so if, quick overview. <laughs> if everyone wants to learn something, um, you, would you mind? Well, it's it's a wrapper around. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. Sorry. Who's familiar with Helm file? Uh, I was asking if there was uh, if he, any knowledge of Helm file, which is, acts as a wrapper around Helm, and. Uh, facilitates uh, automation. Yeah, I haven't had the chance. Uh, I've mainly been using Argo CD, 
and uh, that one you pretty much, depending on how you set up your your repo, it now there's application sets which makes it a lot more dynamic. But it, it's just values file and there's a hierarchy. And you just it just merges them all. Um, that's pr primarily my use for Helm so far, and, and ter a little bit Terraform, but uh, just Argo CD has been my, my main uh, deployment tool. Okay, we had another question. Uh, well, there was actually one in back there who was in, I'll come back. Yep. This is my exercise for the day. <laughs> okay. Was it you? Got it. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, great, great talk today. Um, I'm a total newbie for Kubernetes, but I, um, can you just confirm that the controller is the beginning of like turning an application into like a LAMP stack application, what you would need? Do you need the controller to basically to set up a uh, Apache MySQL or like Nginx uh, MySQL PHP and have them talk to each other? Yeah, so the controller, um, it, so there's different, there's a lot of controllers in Kubernetes. There's already some that are baked in when you spin up a Kubernetes cluster. So like, you know, like for pods and just the uh, native Kubernetes resources, there's already controllers for them. Uh, the ones that I specified are kind of extensions of the ones already, um, that are already in, in, um, in Kubernetes. Um, pretty much the ones that I mentioned, they kind of, they're more for in case you, you're ready to make your application uh, external. Like once you, let's say you did your hello world, you have a LAMP stack that, that you spun up on uh, Kubernetes and now you want to apply it to, let's say you want to access it, you know, remotely. Uh, you know, you have external DNS that will point to uh, the ingress um, if it's external. Um, but yeah, all those would be pretty much just to kind of extend whatever, because you can just install like a uh, thing like you can use uh, micro Kubernetes or K K3s, I don't know how to express that one, but uh, you can use one of those and you can spin up a LAMP stack just like that. You can just have a, a um, either a deployment file or a, a pod file, resource file, and you know, add, you just add your containers that you want to spin up and you can just easily spin up a LAMP stack like that. But these would be an extension once you kind of want to go above and beyond. So let's say you've done like Kelsey's High Tower uh, the hard way and you're like, I'm a cuss fuck, like what do I do now, right? Because you spun up a cluster and um, what do you do now, right? Like what can I do more? And these would kind of help you kind of answer that question as to what can I do now, right? Um, but yeah, it, it, I'm open, in case you want to chat after, I'm open to, you know, Kubernetes. There's a lot of things, even stuff that I mentioned here, there's, it's just open source and there's so many things going on and it's very fast. But if you want to chat after, I'm more than happy to. Um, over here on, um, I'm glad you brought up the technical debt because the cadence of changes in a Kubernetes cluster are just crazy. Yep. So um, as far as the people portion of that, do is there one team who's managing all the uh, Helm charts for the infrastructure or is it broken up into, you know, like the networking team is dealing with the ingress controller and the security team is de dealing with secret controllers and you know things like that. It, it just seems hard to manage and you have to. Yeah, so it really depends on, and you're referring to like, let's say a co like company or where I work, right? Like, um, so it, it varies by, by team, to be honest. Uh, you, some teams or, or the company, they might have the, the bandwidth or you know, the money to pay for like an infrastructure team that can manage this. Uh, for us, uh, at Blizzard specifically, we're a team of, uh, at least for the game teams, we're, a t let's say, 30 SREs, and we're split up in different uh, game teams. And uh, we're kind of siloed in that way, where, like me and two other people, we maintain our Kubernetes infrastructure. So we maintain all these charts, and uh, we have our own workflow for the for Kubernetes. Uh, we have our, uh, of course we share, we kind of, you know, try to, uh, you know, not do things, you know, twice or doing the same way or do double the work and we try to share everything and try to be agnostic in the way we create modules or stuff to share. Uh, but um, yeah, at least from our side, we maintain our own infrastructure and uh, that's why we try to be on top of these things because 
we've already been bit by this multiple times, and you know it, it's it's an, a massive undertaking uh, maintaining a cluster just because there's so many components that are just constantly changing. It, even the Kubernetes versions, they I think they reduced it from four to three I think every year just because they were re releasing uh, versions every every cycle and it was getting too much. <laughs> That's too much for people, I think. Hmm? Okay, we had. Uh. Yeah, thank you so for the talk. Um, you just slightly touched the question uh, how controllers and operators are related. And uh, do I get it right that they're kind of similar thing or? Can you give some more insights on, the, on that? Thank you. Can you repeat the question? I, I missed the first part. Uh, what's the relation between operators and controllers in Kubernetes? So a, a, an operator is more uh, domain specific. So you have like, it, it could be ap application based. So you could have like a vault operator that just looks at vault resources. And uh, the vault operator might have like custom resources called like CRDs. And it would look at those for like events in the, the API or changes, and it it, it 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 applies depending on the operator it applies resources based on that uh, changes to the to to the resource. Uh, the controller uh, would be kind of like the like a, let's see that are native to to Kubernetes. So like uh, like the job controller would be one. Uh, I, I think it's called pod controller. I'm not sure I, I might get the name wrong on that one, but they're all native to Kubernetes resources, and they're already like baked into Kubernetes. The operators are just either someone built it for for their specific application and their custom resources. Yeah. Don't a lot of operators contain a custom controller though? So they they have to. Actually, you stumped me on that one because they they do interact with the with different controllers depending on what events you're watching. But um, yeah, I'm not gonna have asked that question. I'm stumped. Um, I'll probably follow up with you and give you a better answer. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, usually controllers are just like, you know, looking at the world and, yep. and iterating, and an operator is a controller coupled with CRDs yep. that uh, have custom resources that it's operating on. Um, and so like the, the controller pattern came first, you know, it existed for a long time, and then they just kind of named this pattern uh, afterwards called it operators, where you create your own custom resource and then you uh, modify objects right. based on CRDs. There you go. Smarter guy than me right there answered <laughs> it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So I've got a quick question on um, Argo CD for uh, rollback or canary deployments. Mm. That would be an awesome tool. So my question is for a rollback, uh, what would trigger uh, a rollback on a canary deployment? Would it be a crash loop event or would it be uh, a health check endpoint on a deployment? So it, it depends. Argo CD just uh, does like the native uh, like deployments. So depending on the deployment, have you, have you has, how you have it set up, uh, depending on the health checks you're checking and um, uh, what's the other one? Uh, the amount of the pods that are unavailable. Uh, but there is a thing called uh, Argo rollouts, which is an extension of uh, Argo CD is maintained by the same, uh, I think it's Intuit, the company that built Argo CD. Uh, there's a, there's, they have another component called Argo rollouts, which uh, has those blue green deployments canary, and those have certain conditions you can set. Um, so let's say you have a percentage or, or something for deployment. Uh, rollouts will look at that depending on what thresholds you set, and it will roll back depending on the thresholds you set. Any more questions? Awesome. Oh. Well, I have maybe it's more like a comment or a question mm -hmm. to the audience. Uh, since you haven't noticed the scaffold uh, within this automated 
deployment and maintaining things. So uh, I wonder if anyone has any experience running scaffold for like production environment. So you mean you mean scaffold with a K, the cloud native project? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it varies by, you know. Just like the company or whatever you're trying to do, I, I think everyone might have templates and stuff. Um, but production ready is a very, it's a loaded term, I would say. Um, well, maybe someone has a better answer, but there could be many different ways you can do something um, and set different <coughs> templates. I'm not sure if there's anything open source that kind of has something that would be production ready. Um, but yeah, I don't think I have a better answer for that one, sorry. Okay, one more here. Scaffold is a great tool for development, but it's also a CLI. So if you're using Scaffold in production, that feels like a single point of failure. If ever that CLI stopped, or if ever the box that was running that CLI was reset, then your deployments would stop. I think I would rather some cloud native something that was continuously monitoring that did the thing. So would I wrap scaffold in GitHub Actions or you know something like that? I think I'm starting to over engineer it. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Comments? Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending.